Good afternoon and welcome to the 663rd meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm Barbara Van Allen, President and CEO of the club. It's an honor to be here with all of you in our milestone year, our 115th anniversary. Over the past two years, through our diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion programming, we've been leveraging the club's platform to bring together prominent thought leaders to help us explore and better understand the various dimensions of inequity in underrepresented communities, and to highlight strategies, best practices, and resources that business can use to be a force for change. We've not been doing this work alone. We'd like to give special thanks to our corporate partners, BlackRock, Bloomberg, MasterCard, PayPal, S&P Global, and Taconic Capital, as well as the many members, speakers, and subject matter experts that are now and will continue to be engaged in this work. Thank you to all of you. A special welcome to members of the ECNY 2022 class of fellows, a select group of diverse rising next gen business thought leaders, as well as a number of graduate students from Rutgers University and Columbia Business School joining us today. I am really honored to welcome our guest, Nicole Elam, President and CEO of the National Bankers Association. The National Bankers Association is the premier trade association and voice for the nation's minority financial institutions. She's the youngest president and CEO since the association's founding in 1927. Nicole joined the NBA in May of 21 from J.P. Morgan Chase, where she was vice president and government relations manager. In this role, she also managed national engagement strategies and led efforts on the firm's commitment to invest $30 billion over five years to advance racial equity and drive inclusive economic growth. Nicole has spent more than 17 years working in public policy and public affairs. Prior to J.P. Morgan Chase, she led the government and external affairs strategy for ITT Educational Services. Nicole also worked as a senior director at the government affairs firm Ice Miller Strategies, LLC. She's held legal roles as an attorney at Ken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, focusing on congressional investigations and government enforcement actions, and as a law clerk at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund in Washington, D.C. The format today will be a conversation, which we're for fortunate to have club member and former CNBC chief international correspondent, Michelle Caruso Cabrera as our moderator. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nicole. We're gonna end promptly at 2.45. Any questions that were submitted to the club from members were shared and will be addressed during the conversation. In addition, we will we'll be using the chat box today and you can enter your uh, questions directly in the chat box. And if there's time, Michelle will certainly uh, try to use those time permitting, as I said. As a reminder, the conversation is on the record and we do have media on the line this afternoon. Michelle, I'm happy to pass this time over to you. Thank you. Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and a pleasure to do this and honor to interview you, Nicole, in this important discussion. Um, just so we set the, the stage here, um, so people understand uh, the organizations that the uh, NBA represents, uh, MDIs, Minority Depository Institutions, are actually defined by law yeah. uh, starting since 1989. It's a federally insured depository institution where 51% or more of the voting stock is owned by minority individuals or a majority of the board of directors is minority and the community that the institution serves is predominantly minority. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the organizations that are members of the um, NBA. Tell me why, Nicole, are MDIs, monetary uh, depository institutions, important? Well, first, I want to thank you, Barbara, and the Economic Club of New York for inviting me here today. And Michelle, thank you for moderating today's conversation. Uh, but your question is a great one. Why do MDIs matter? And, you know, minority depository institutions matter because they are significant providers of mortgages and small business loans in black and brown communities. Now, why does that matter? It matters because over the last two years, 
everybody has been talking about closing the racial wealth gap. And it is really hard to close the racial wealth gap without the financial institutions that have been supporting those community communities since you know they were first created. These are institutions that were born out of racism because black, brown, and immigrant communities could not go to mainstream financial institutions for their banking services. So to just step back and think about the wealth gap, oftentimes people don't think about what are the key drivers to wealth creation. Well, the three key drivers to wealth creation are are having access to banking services. It's really hard to grow your wealth if you don't have access to banking services. Home ownership continues to be a key driver of wealth creation and owning a profitable small business. And so when you think about those three things, MDIs are at the center of all of those things for black and brown communities. Those are the ones that are oftentimes saying yes to lending when mainstream financial institutions are saying no. So a question that I typically get is, well, because these, these institutions are over a century old, right? Because they were born out of racism, do they still matter today? And the answer is unfortunately yes, because data continues to show that black and brown people, even with the same um, financial record, right, with the same credit profile, are still being denied at a rate that is two times that of their white counterparts. So these are institutions that are, again, providing mortgages and small business loans and communities that are oftentimes underserved by mainstream banking institutions. Yeah, I was reading, there's been a lot of work done uh, by the Milken Institute, yes. by uh, various organizations, and the overlay of areas where the CDC defines a community as vulnerable yep. and where MDI serve is, is very coincident. Mm -hmm. They're in the areas that need the most help. Yeah. And as you defined, right, you, you talked about the definition of an MDI. These are banks that are one, predominantly owned or operated by people of color, and two, predominantly sit in and serve minority communities. It's not a surprise then that they are so active in those communities and providing mortgages and small business loans to close the wealth gap. This is a New York audience. Are there uh, MDIs here? There must be. What are some of the big yes, ones here? Yes, they are. There are about a dozen MDIs in New York. Um, I'll call out a, a few. The majority of them are, are Asian MDIs, which isn't a big surprise. There are, are only about 143 MDIs across the nation, uh, and over 70 of them are Asian. So you, the predominant majority of those that are in New York are Asian. You've got one Black MDI, Carver Federal Bank, um, one multiracial bank, which there are only two multiracial banks in the, in the entire U.S., uh, and that's Piermont. One is in New York. Um, you have your largest Hispanic bank, Popular, is there. So there, there are a dozen of them there. Fantastic. Um, the 2008 financial crisis was really difficult for MDIs, devastated them. There used to be more than 200 uh, mm -hmm. before the financial crisis. A large percentage of them failed. You mentioned now there's only 143 left in the U.S., why did so many MDIs fail back then? Was that the quality of the assets? Was that uh, you know uh, the liability side, a run on deposits? What lessons did we learn from that so that way we can make MDIs uh, stronger in the future? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the 2008 financial crisis impacted the entire banking sector, right? So you saw a decline throughout the entire industry. Um, now there are over 3,800 3, less banks today than there were then. Um, but MDIs, you really saw that. There, there was a 40% decline in MDIs. And when you double click down on particularly the Black banks, those have been the most undercapitalized and those have seen the most consolidation. So there were 41 before the start of the financial crisis. Today, there are only 19, so cut in half. Um, they've also seen the most consolidation historically at large. At its peak, there were over 134 MDIs, uh, Black MDIs. Today, again, there are only 19. So they've experienced the most consolidation. Why is that? The first is around undercapitalization. These are banks that have not had access to the same capital markets as other uh, financial institutions. So when you're undercapitalized, and your community gets hit hard by an economic downturn, guess what? You're hit hard by that economic downturn as well because you are serving that very community. So it underscored the importance of needing more capital for these undercapitalized banks that do so much in those communities. The second thing that it underscored was just the, the role that systemic racism has played because it wasn't a, a liquidity issue. What it was was an asset quality issue. When you think about you know, loans and, and, and the collateral that is needed for loans, a lot of it is real estate. 
Well, if you're in a market that historically has experienced redlining or did not qualify for um, federally backed mortgage loans because it was a black or brown community and it was considered hazardous, it's no surprise that there are huge appraisal gaps there. So a lot of the collateral that was used for lending and those and those communities that these banks served experience a huge drop and they never recover like maybe the white neighborhoods did. Um, so appraisal gaps were, were huge. The redlining was huge. All of those things are linked. And so I think it, it goes to show one, more capital, but two, the impact of systemic racism that we really need to be making sure that we're focused on. That's why people talk so much about the appraisal gaps and more credit enhancements, because those are things that can get at the historic um, systemic racism that you've seen that have impacted collateral in these communities. When you say they were undercapitalized, is it that they weren't meeting the ratios back then, or was it we no, saw, I, like all banks were, we realized were undercapitalized back then? No, I, I, I don't think that you can say all banks were undercapitalized. I think this is a small bank problem, but it's it's particularly a minority depository institution problem. So historically, the, the capital of, of MDIs has ranged around $200 million. So these are the smallest of the smallest banks, right? You don't have a lot of capital to begin with compared to like my former employer, a $3 trillion plus bank, right? Or the average bank is about $4 billion. So these are the smallest of the smallest banks. If they're born out of racism, they don't have access to those same markets. They can't just go and get capital the same way that maybe a larger financial institution can do that. So it, it's it's not that every bank was undercapitalized. I think it just really goes to show these particular banks and particularly your small banks as well. The, uh, the tiny size that you, you highlighted um, means that they often can't also do big business, yeah. big loans. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's which is a key way to make money, right? Obviously, okay. for a bank, what can be done to overcome that so that they can get into some of the bigger the bigger loans out there? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because oftentimes they are locked out of those opportunities because of size, right? They're too right. small, they can't do it, they can't do it. But there are two things that we've seen that has worked. One, a number of the large GSIPs have made commitments to MDIs as well as CDFIs, community development financial institutions, um, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, City, Wells Fargo, Truist, all of them have made um, commitments. So as part of their commitment, they can bring these MDIs in on part of these uh, big, big opportunities as co-leads, not as participants, right? Loan participations oftentimes are cost prohibitive for these small banks to participate in, but bringing them in as a co-lead on a syndicate is something that they can do, particularly if they've already made a commitment to MDIs. A second thing that you can do because they don't have the scale is collaboration, right? So last year, the Atlanta Hawks said as part of their commitment to advance racial equity, they wanted to use minority banks to finance their new training facility. Well, not one bank had the scale to do that. So a consortium of 10 banks, it didn't take 10 banks. At that point, it was just, you know, coming together for the good of this opportunity. 10 banks came together to participate in a loan syndication. So whether it is partnering with a, a large bank or it is them coming together as smaller banks, there are certainly opportunities for them to achieve the type of scale that they need to participate in these opportunities. I think that the key point is what you raised, Michelle, is not allowing size to continue to prohibit them or the fact that they don't have a track record. That's something that you hear all the time. Oh, they're too small. They don't have a track record. They're not going to be able to get a track record if you don't give them that opportunity. Right. right. What about um, being so small that it's hard to afford the technology that so yeah. many banks are using, you know, what apps, et cetera, yeah. online interface portals, uh, et cetera. Um, does your organization help them when it comes to things like technology or things that a small bank can't do, but if they had some scale or worked with others that they could? Yeah, absolutely. Technology is something that is huge in the banking industry, and it really exploded during the pandemic. You know, what we found was that banks that had technology were able to perform better, right? They were able to keep their virtual doors open, if you will, to continue to serve their customers. They were able to push out PPP loans, but technology is expensive, but it's underpinning everything that we do, not just the way that we live, work, and play, but the way that we bank. And so they've got to have technology to keep up. But because technology 
is expensive, uh, they don't have the scale that they need. That's one of the biggest cost prohibitive reasons is it's so expensive. And if you're a small bank, that's, you know, 200, 300 million dollars. Technology is, is too much. So one of the things that we do as a trade association is we try to serve as a shared resource center, you know, really trying to collaborate and bring opportunities of scale to the table so that we can take advantage uh, of tech and talent on behalf of these banks. So we are brokering fintech partnerships so that our banks can do more online onboarding. They can uh, open more accounts, if you will, online. They can do more automated lending for mortgages and small business loans. They can do more of P2P, so the Zelle and, and all of those peer-to-peer -peer payments that they, they can't do on their own. So we're brokering and building those fintech partnerships. We're also uh, negotiating special prices for these uh, MDIs. We're trying to have a centralized chief technology officer. So all of these things we're trying to centralize and do because Individually, they don't have the scale, but together we have the scale to get further faster. And so we are really trying to do as much of that as we possibly can, realizing that there are two things that I think are going to threaten the longevity of MDIs. One, technology, because banking now is all about technology, but two, their ability to capture the next generation, right? I, we, I talked a little bit about the history of MDIs, that they were born out of racism. So my parents, my grandparents, my, my, my ancestors, they all used it, but I may not know about an MDI, and I'm really not going to know about it if, they're, if they don't have technology. I can't get on right. an app. I can't do all these types of things. So if they don't get technology together, it's going to really impact their survivability. Just staying on the theme of technology, if you're able to achieve that, can technology reduce the racial wealth gap? Absolutely. I think technology does two primary things. One, it improves um, the access to financial services and second, the affordability of financial services. So with technology, it increases access because you can reach people whether you have a brick or mortar there or not. You can reach people on their phones. So it allows you to reach more people. It also allows you to do more financial wellness training, right? People aren't wanting to come in and sit in a class and hear you talk about financial wellness. But if it's an app that's integrated into the way that I'm uh, establishing a banking relationship or increasing or leveraging a banking relationship. So technology helps you do more of that. Um, technology also helps with the affordability, right? With technology, I can operate more efficiently. I can reduce my cost. I can reduce my risk. And so technology is, is very important to reducing the wealth gap because of these two things of it helping to drive access to and the affordability of financial services. Uh, we have a get, we have a one of our viewers has asked a question related to this. Are MDIs taking on a disproportionate role in improving financial literacy among minorities? Yeah, so here's the interesting thing about, um, about financial literacy. It is now kind of a, a buzzword, but the interesting thing about particularly black, brown and immigrant communities is that you can't just give them capital, right? You can't just give them a loan. You have to make sure that they are capital ready, mortgage ready. So I think what has always distinguished MDIs from maybe mainstream financial institutions is it takes so much of our personnel because we are doing a lot of that coaching, that financial literacy as we're providing them with whatever capital that they need. So we have always been um, focused on capital and coaching whenever we're doing lending. And I think that's also too what drives up the operational cost of an MDI because they are doing so much of this handholding and walking people through the process. That's not something that you've historically seen mainstream financial institutions do. It's obviously become a buzzword and a trend as of late, but that is something that has always been um, indebted into the DNA of these institutions. Uh, I want to move on to a little bit to regulatory uh, issues. What are the policy priorities for the NBA when you're talking to legislators yeah. in Washington or in various states? What, what's your message to them? Yeah, so we have a, a number of policy priorities. And if I were to bucket them, I, I would bucket them in capital, right? So in, in increasing the capital that is going to these um, financial institutions is, is huge. So you saw Treasury's Emergency Capital Investment Program. You saw the plus up of the CDFI fund, which provides grants uh, to MDIs and CDFIs. And many MDIs are also what's considered community development financial institutions, um, where 60% of their activity is done in underserved communities. And so increase 
increasing capital is a huge priority. So passage of the Ensuring Diversity and Community Banking Act, uh, the promoting and advancing communities of colors through inclusive lending, all of those things are focused on increasing capital to these institutions amongst other things. Another thing is increasing grants and financial support um, for, for MDIs. We talked a lot about technology and the technology gap that exists and how cost prohibitive technology is. So really pushing for authorizing dollars to support grants for technology uh, and also grants to support starting a new minority depository institution. It's costs a lot of money to start a new bank. And so providing grants and financial support to start new MDIs. Another yes. thing go, is- go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, focused on increasing um, opportunities for MDIs. So, you know, as of late, you've heard a lot of people talk about the infrastructure and transportation bill, particularly last year and the beginning of this year. Well, one thing that we're asking is, are you including MDIs in the financing of these public projects, right? Who are you using for these projects? And so ensuring that MDIs have a seat at the table and the financing of these, of these public projects. So those are all things, the Community Reinvestment Act, right? This is something that is up uh, for, for, for review and reform. So those are some of the things that we're focused on from a legislative perspective. Let's drill down a little bit more into some of those. The FDIC has announced a program to provide more capital for MDIs. Visa just announced they are going to put $100 million worth of deposits yeah. in uh, MDIs. I assume you think these are good things. And is there more of these to come? Yeah, I think these are good things, right? The FDIC's Mission Driven Bank Fund was something that, you know, was started by the former chair, Yellen and McWilliams. Um, and it was about, you know, providing more capital. And it's since evolved to providing capital and strategic advisory services for MDIs and CDFIs. I think this is good. You've seen a lot of these equity funds. Uh, MDI Keepers Fund was actually the first equity fund that was started in 2015 to provide more capital to MDIs. Uh, but unfortunately, nobody was paying attention to equity. And so it wasn't until the unfortunate murder of George Floyd that people actually started to put into this fund. Um, visa making deposits. That's a trend that you saw really two years ago where people didn't know how to help. So they said, oh, we're just going to do a deposit. And what we encourage people to do is don't stop at deposits, right? Because people need capital to offset a deposit. A deposit is really a liability on your balance sheet because I've got to pay to keep your money because you can take it out at any time. And so we really were focused on, it's not just about deposits, but making sure that you're having established banking relationships. So with Visa, we've been working with them about ways that they can do more from a financial services perspective. How can our banks leverage your uh, credit card rails to do things like payment processing and things that have been cost prohibitive for them to do uh, in, in the past? Uh, merchant services, right? Every time somebody swipes a card, who are you using to process that? These are all things that we're, we're really talking to folks about. Don't stop at just making a deposit. Really try to have an established banking relationship, or maybe it's not an established banking relationship. Maybe it is really leveraging your expertise around technology or leveraging, if you're a big bank, your expertise around investments or, or climate finance or whatever it may be so that our banks could start to get into things that they haven't been able to get into before because they didn't have that expertise in-house. You also, um, one of the priorities is, as you mentioned, to amend the Bank Holding Company Act yeah. to allow MDIs and CDFI banks under $3 billion to raise additional capital without triggering the change of control provisions. Yeah. What does that mean to somebody who's hearing that for the first time and why does it matter? Yeah, that is so important. So the Bank Holding Company Act basically has a, a provision that's called change of control provision. And it's triggered whenever an investment exceeds 25% of the institution's equity. Now, why does it matter? It matters now because people are all focused on investing in MDIs uh, because it's part of their racial equity commitment or they're focused on closing the wealth gap. Well, oftentimes they're prohibited from doing that because if you're a small bank, it doesn't take a lot to trigger that 25% threshold. And so what happens is um, people who are wanting to make investments in MDIs are arbitrarily limited. You know, they can't maybe make more than a million or, or 5 million or what have you because they don't want to trigger this 25% threshold. So what we've really been advocating is eliminating and uh, that change of control provision. So if you are a small bank that's under $3 billion, 
we want an exemption from this Bank Holding Company Act change of control provision so that if you're an investor, you can make an investment in, of, of non-voting stock uh, into this bank or in exchange for your investment, get non-voting stock. That matters because oftentimes people aren't making investments in MDIs because it's not worth it, right? If you're a small bank, I might trigger it with $500,000 or a million dollars or what have you. It's, it's just not worth me making that investment. So allowing um, for investors to make that, that investment that it sees 25% would be really important. And just so everybody understands, this isn't about changing the very definition of the bank because once, presuming, let's say this is an outside investor who is not a minority, this yeah. isn't about violating the definition of the MDI. It's more about the degree of control that they have, correct? It's about the, the degree of control. And if that degree of control changes too much, then your status as a minority depository institution is, is at stake. But it's really about the, the non-cumulative, non-voting stock. Um, that's, that's really what matters. There shouldn't be a limit on that. Um, the, a number of other um, topics in here, I, when I look at the, uh, you know, if you, people go to the NBA website, you can read all the legislative priorities. Yeah. One of them is related to TARP. Yeah. The Troubled Asset Relief Program that many in our audience may think is over. And I guess it is yeah. officially. But are there some MDI still um, stuck yeah. in the TARP program? You have a few um, MDIs that are still stuck in the TARP program. And because they were stuck in the TARP program, they haven't been able to take advantage of a lot of the investment opportunities. So for example, Treasury's Emergency Capital Investment Program, that was $9 billion that went to MDI, CDFI, banks, and credit unions. Well, if you were still involved in TARP, you could not take advantage of the ESIP dollars. Now, why does that matter? It matters because this was an unprecedented amount of dollars that was going into the sector, $9 billion. Can you imagine if you had access to $9 billion in capital, how that could help your bank grow? We see some banks that are, are doubling in size as a result of their opportunity to take advantage of, of ESIP. And so because they are still involved in TARP, they haven't been able to take advantage of some of these opportunities that are out here right now. And, and why, why are they still in TARP? Is it capital adequacy yeah, issues? There's, What's going there's on? A number of, yeah, there's a number of different reasons why uh, some of them are still involved in, in TARP, but it's, a, it's, a, it, it's something that could be resolved. Got it. Um, MBIs tend to, let's talk a little bit when I'm thinking about asset quality here and thinking about TARP and real estate. Um, mm -hmm. The MBIs tend to have a higher number of commercial real estate loans compared to other institutions. Why is that? And, and it's highlighted as a risk, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, why is that? And what can be done to diversify their assets to make them less concentrated? Yeah, I think it goes back to why MDIs were created to begin with, right? MDIs were making loans when mainstream financial institutions were not, right? They're saying yes when others are not. And you oftentimes don't see mainstream financial institutions making loans to churches, Right. And so that is a huge area that many MDIs, particularly your black MDIs, are making a church loans. Church loans are a huge part because mainstream financial institutions aren't doing church loans. Some of it is just reputational risk. Right. Nobody wants the headline that they close down a church, if you will. And so they're not they don't they're not engaging in that. And so you see many MDIs are making investments in these um, community anchors like churches or community anchors like a nonprofit institution. And so that's why you see so many um, CRE loans being made because oftentimes many of them are church loans when those churches could not go to other mainstream financial institutions. Um, and many, when you look historically, many black institutions were actually born out of black churches. That was a gathering spot, right? That's where many of the leaders came from. And so historically, there's a, there's a huge connection in, in terms of the benefit and the role of black churches in the community. So, you know, MDIs are, are really having to diversify their portfolio so that they're not just the bank of the community or just the bank of the black church, so that there's a lower concentration. And so we've really been intentional at helping our banks diversify by doing things like getting in engaged in climate financing. Um, those are some of the areas that we're really trying to encourage our banks to get engaged and involved in. But oftentimes where you see them at is, is really because of, of history. Interesting. Yeah, there's a prominent um, black church here in, in the Bronx uh, in New York that has been very associated with um, affordable housing. 
Yes. Uh, because yep. they didn't see anybody else doing it. Yes. So they decided to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. that, and then it's a very kind of organic um, situation that arises when people, you know, yeah. necessity is the mother of invention, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned climate finance is one way. These churches don't necessarily, excuse me, these MDIs don't necessarily have expertise in climate yeah. finance, right? Is that something that NBA can help with? It is. It is. So we're really trying to be a centralized resource center as it relates to tech and talent. So those are both things that you need scale to take advantage of. And climate financing is is a unique thing, just like mortgage is a unique thing. And you oftentimes need lenders and underwriters who understand the compliance uh, and regulatory uh, landscape, who who knows where to go and find these deals. And if you're a small bank, you know, I already may have a person who's wearing two or three hats. Why would I add this, this third hat our fourth hat on them for something that, you know, I don't really know. And and there's a lot to it. And so we've been um, working with with support from the Hewlett Foundation and with others to really hire on the consultants and those climate finance lenders who can help our banks get more engaged in an area that they don't have the scale to hire their own expertise around. I listened to a podcast that you did um, and you discussed with that interviewer uh, bank examiners. Yeah. Um, and in particular, that they don't tend to understand mission driven banks yeah. and that bank examiners, when when examining MDIs and regulating them, that they they have to understand the point. Can you yeah. tell me more about that? What, what would you like to see differently when it comes to bank examiners? Yeah. So when it comes to examiners, bank examiners oftentimes lack diversity in hue and view. Right. So you don't see a lot of diversity in the racial and ethnic backgrounds of of these examiners. The second thing is you don't see a lot of diversity and their understanding of mission driven banks. And so what happens is when you are reviewing a bank, you're going through your supervisory process. You're oftentimes comparing this mission driven bank to what you would consider a peer group. But their peer group is probably serving a wealthier demographic, is not serving a demographic that has fallen victim of redlining and the borrowers in their community haven't fallen victim of redlining and appraisal gaps and all of these um, systemic racism. And so when you're comparing these demographics that you see are peer groups, you're making unfair comparisons because you don't understand the mission of this bank. This bank is here to serve a demographic that has been underserved and underserved doesn't mean low income, right? Oftentimes people think black, brown, low income, that's not the case, right? People are still being denied for credit, even when they have the same credit profile uh, as white counterparts. And so it's it's because of that, oftentimes they are making, um, they're not sensitive to the special risk factors associated with running a mission-driven bank. And it has led to, unfortunately, some banks um, you know, having to to close their doors, right? Because they they have been unfairly examined. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. So a bank examiner goes in and there's, you know, there's capital ratios, there's arm length loans. Yep. Um, there's, you know, I guess how loans are collateralized. Yep. Where, when the rubber hits oh. the road, what's, what's going on there? When the rubber meets the road, it is because I don't understand that most of your loans are collateralized and most of the collateral is real estate. And most of that real estate has been historically undervalued from a real estate perspective. I'm comparing you and I'm saying, oh man, this portfolio isn't good, isn't strong. Or things like, um, You know, when we're making right now, something that is popular is alternative credit, credit, uh, uh, looking at alternative forms of credit. Right. So that is something that is that has been very popular. But that has been something that our banks have historically done. Right. Because we know that algorithms can have biases in there. I know that I can look at the inflows and exflows as you know, if you're if you're looking for a small business loan, I can look at your inflows and exflows and I can say, oh, man, you you're 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 standard. Right. Like you're you're good. Or I can um, I can look at the fact that maybe you don't have a mortgage payment that is consistent, but you've got a rent payment that is consistent. And those are things that I'm looking at. But if I'm comparing what you're doing to somebody else, I can say, oh, why are you looking at these things? And I can be dinged. And so that goes to the safety and soundness of your lending practices, as opposed to going to take into consideration, no, this is a different, different demographic that is served that when you look out, they're not defaulting any more than somebody else over time. Yeah, I, I imagine um, trying to assess the loan to a church, someone would be looking at the, the weekly tithing, yeah. um, which wouldn't be 
traditional compared to say, if you're looking at rents in a, mm -hmm. an apartment building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Got it. Um, the um, Jamie Dimon said recently that he thinks there's a hurricane coming, mm -hmm. uh, a financial hurricane coming. Considering all that we have talked about the struggle of MDIs, are you worried right now? Yeah, I, I think what I'm really trying to do is make sure that my banks are in the best possible position from a capital perspective, that they will be um, better situated for an economic downturn. I'm also trying to make sure that they're diversified, right? So that uh, they don't have all of their portfolio and one thing, that they have the technology to sustain themselves, that they are part of these formal or informal mentor protege uh, relationships so that they are working with big banks. So I'm, I'm really trying to focus on the capital and the business models of our banks so that they are in a much better position. Um, we're also trying to encourage people who want to do equity funds to maybe focus on loan loss reserve funds so that when an economic downturn happens, that these banks that are supporting borrowers that are going to be hit often first and hardest uh, are able to sustain themselves. So these are the things that we're trying to make sure that 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 we're prepared for. Uh, one thing that we know is that things are cyclical, right? It, it's going to come up and it's going to come down. That's always going to happen. And we want to make sure that we're not losing more MDIs at a downturn uh, than we did before. I, I would guess that um, you talked about uh, how uh, loan officers at MDIs have to wear multiple hats, so it's very hard yeah. to specialize. I would also imagine that maybe there's a lack of expertise when it comes to workouts. And when you have a troubled loan, mm -hmm. wh what gets done? I mean, maybe that's another area that the NBA yeah. can help with in terms of, yeah. if, you know, God forbid that's going to be a big mm -hmm. need. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the more people talk, the more worried I get that that's going to be something yeah. that's going to be required. And I think what's great now um, is that you have seen a focus on MDIs and CDFIs over the last couple of years. So there is an unprecedented amount of capital that's flowing into these institutions. And so the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of that capital has been focused on lending and not operational or infrastructure. And so I'm concerned that they won't be able to push out all of this capital that they are receiving unless they get some more flexible capital to hire more people to invest in technology. And some of them are starting to do that now. If we, indeed we have another uh, tough situation, um, going back to the 2008 financial crisis, were the MDIs able to capture a lot of the help that was happening at the time? The, um, I mean, there were so many special provisions made for Goldman Sachs, for example, and their ability to change yeah. their status. Um, did we learn anything back then about what MDIs needed and should get access to in the event of a financial hurricane? Yeah, I, I think you saw a lot of conversation around loan loss reserve funds, right, and helping mm -hmm. with economic downturns. Um, you saw conversations around just the undercapitalization, and you saw conversations around deeper things that are more systemic that we still haven't found solutions for. Uh, things like the appraisal gaps, right? Things that are still in conversation. There's also a lot of you know, regulatory sandbox that happened um, where people were given a, a space to try new things. But unfortunately, a lot of those new things weren't being tried uh, at small banks. A lot of those things were being, being tried at maybe larger financial institutions. So there were a lot of lessons. Um, have we implemented them all? No. Right. No. Uh, there's still work to be done. Uh, Tara Hariharan has sent in. She's an ECNY 2022 fellow. Uh, thank you, Tara, for your question. What can the broader financial industry, banking regulators and public policy do to advance financial literacy in underserved communities? Yeah, so the interesting thing about financial literacy is that people talk a lot about um, education, 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 but it, it's not just about giving people the education. You really have to give them the education at a point where it changes their um, established banking relationship or it encourages them to establish a banking relationship. So we've been working a lot with fintechs who do automated lending, um, who you can apply for a loan, receive a loan online, and we're encouraging them to offer financial literacy or financial wellness programs as an incentive. So if you complete that, then maybe you get a better interest rate. Um, the same is, is, is true when we are doing uh, 
um, financial wellness programs. We're offering them. And when you complete a module, it takes you back to maybe doing something different or opening a, a bank account or an investment account or this, that, the other, right? So connecting that module learning to having them do something that changes their banking behavior. So I think what you can do is not have education separate from changing banking behavior. It needs to be linked to changing banking behavior, or it's just going to be information that goes in one ear and out of the out of the other, which I think is why uh, apps are so important, right? Because apps off, oftentimes encourages you to do something. So as you have all of these apps that you can open an account or you can get a loan or all of those things should be linked to financial wellness and financial literacy. Is there anything I should have asked you or you expected me to ask you or anything you'd like to leave the audience with? <sighs> I think the only thing that I would like to leave the audience with is find a way to work with minority depository institutions, whether it is a, um, a deposit or it's whether it's offering your technology expertise or it is um, finding a way to integrate them into your, your racial equity programs. Find a way to work with it. And if you need help, reach out to the National Bankers Association. You know, over the last two years, we have evolved from your traditional DC policy advocacy association to one that is really focused on creating pathways for partnerships to better capitalize, modernize, and strengthen MDIs. And so we can work with you to, to create a partnership that works best for your institution. And we are all cheering you on. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure uh, and an honor to chat with you today. And thanks for doing this. And so you can see Barbara's back. Hi, Barbara. Hi there. And thank you both, uh, Michelle and Nicole. Just a great conversation. And we always like it when we can come away with specific strategies and approaches that uh, the financial community and the business community can use to help move the needle. So again, many thanks to both of you. I'm pleased to report that we have many more great speakers lined up. Uh, and as always, we encourage you to invite uh, guests to our events. Um, we uh, had Arvind Krishna, uh, the chair and CEO of IBM, plan for tomorrow at lunch. And he unfortunately has laryngitis. So we are lucky enough to have coming in his steed, um, the president and CEO of Red Hat, Paul Cormier, and he will be here again. That's an in-person hybrid event tomorrow, June 7th. And we're getting the word out now to everyone that had registered for digital or in-person. On June the 14th, we have Sean Henry. He's the president of CrowdStrike. Uh, Evan Greenberg joins us, the chair and CEO of Chubb uh, Limited and Chubb Group on June the 16th, also in person. Brian Cornell, the chair and CEO of Target, uh, also an in-person hybrid, June the 21st. On June the 27th, we're going to be um, honoring Roger Ferguson and Stanley Fisher for our Peter G. Peterson Leadership Excellence Award dinner. And Roger Ferguson will be giving an address on the future of capitalism. And uh, I want to mention Sarah Armbruster, the president and CEO of Steelcase, will join us uh, July 21st and will be giving insights on what does uh, the structure of back to work look like uh, in offices and other related issues. And then just uh, late breaking news, uh, we will have Glenn Hubbard and uh, Larry Summers uh, joining us also in July, and we will soon be announcing the date. I'd like to take a moment to uh, recognize our 346 members of the Centennial Society, those that joined us today for their contributions, which continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and help us offer our uh, diverse programming now and into the future. So again, uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, everyone, please enjoy the rest of your day and uh, hope to see many of you tomorrow. Thank you.